So, Brian, my first question to you. Um, you seem very pessimistic about the, the, the uh, growth, particularly the export growth opportunities for, for horticulture, given the free trade agreement. A lot of growers I speak to um, talk about, um, in the past, the high exchange rate as being an impediment. So, so what, there's a bit of a disconnect there, it seems to be. Um, well, I don't think we're... I wouldn't have thought we're all that pessimistic. Perhaps um, realistic might be a better word. I mean, we've, we're suggesting 1% average year on year over the medium term. I mean, 1% in real terms isn't, isn't nothing. Um, but, um, you know, there are some reasons to think that this growth won't be unlimited. For a start, the, um, the decline in, in the value of the dollar has already happened, and we don't see too much more of that happening. We assume that, that the Australian dollar, which is at 78 cents or something now, will average 76 cents over the medium term. Um, and the other thing on the dollar, of course, is that the US dollar is not the only um, game around and, and other currencies are uh, you know, not as strong as the US dollar. Our dollar against the Japanese yen has stayed um, pretty much constant. Uh, against the euro, it's, if anything, strengthened a bit. So, uh, you know, those cans of tomatoes coming in from Italy have become slightly more competitive in recent years. The um, trade agreements certainly are positive um, and, um, you know, some things have already happened. I think uh, there's been a, um, an increase in ch cherries going into Korea, but a lot of those things are being phased in over, well, in the case of China, four years or ten years. So if we're looking ahead five years, um, you know, over the whole range of horticultural products going to all the countries in the world, those free trade agreements are... Good, obviously, good, better rather than bad, but um, you know they're just one more, uh, one more little gain for horticulture. They're not going to totally um, change the face of our exports. Thanks, Brian. Uh, we've got a question. Trent Apoli, Harry. This one's for you, mate. Great presentation. Um, what's the silver lining on the current berry category opportunity? And where do you see that in your business, I don't know, fast forward 24 months from now? And I'd like a similar comment from Coles as well. Uh, the, the fresh berry uh, market is very fascinating. It's our fastest growing category. Uh, demand's picked up for probably ob obvious reasons. Um, we're spending about $52 million this year on, on eight new berry projects. So. We're thinking double-digit growth for blue, blueberries, raspberries, and probably a little bit less for strawberries. And we've got new black, black virginies coming in a little bit later, in about two years. So um, the per capita consumption of uh, fresh berries in this country is still only 60% of the US consumption. So there's a lot, a lot of room for move if we do it well. And I think uh, with the new varieties, we are doing it relatively well. I think if you go back, the raspberry industry was a, a niche product four years ago because they were, they were very small berries, fairly flavourless, and they had two to three days shelf life. The Driscoll's varieties we're now growing have uh, 10 to 12 days shelf life, and I mentioned the 18 tonnes a hectare we're getting, albeit with a lot of capital investment, and the market is growing exponentially because people are now getting a flavoursome product. What we've been trying to do is get flavour back into a lot of these products. So um, the, the berries, so I think berries are going to be the biggest category in the whole fresh produce market. Maybe that's a bit ambitious, but that's what we think. But maybe Jackie might allude to that. Um, yeah, so berries would be what we would, cons could, would call an expandable category. So if you've got the product um, at the right quality, at the right price, you'll get that incidental pick up by customers. 40 million customers a week picking up a punnet of strawberries or raspberries is a, a good place to be. Um, so I've long felt that our berry category, is, with the exception probably of fresh blueberries, has been a really underperforming area, very inconsistent in quality. Um, you know, punnets causing very variable in size, punnet formation causing bruise and squash fruit and things like this. So I think what the industry has done over the last sort of three years to address some of that um, is phenomenal. And I can't see any reason why it wouldn't continue to grow dramatically. As far as, you know, the food scare element and the knock-on, I mean, clearly for us, and I'm sure everybody in, the, in selling frozen berries, it's been a huge 
impact. It's definitely affected that category. Um, it'll recover. I've been through n multiple food scares in my time. You know, it'll be all over in six months' time. Whether that Nana's brand as such will come back, but it's really just a change of packaging from their point of view. John West and many others have survived similar food scares in the past, so I think it will settle. It always does. We can't grow enough berries in this country for the demand anyway, so it's going to have to go back to an imported situation if uh, people want to be able to do the smoothies and all the rest of it that they've always wanted to do. So it's not, you know, it's obviously disastrous for the people concerned. It's disastrous for that organisation. It's actually disastrous for the Chinese growing industry, many of whom do an excellent job, as I'm sure many in this room have been up there to see, and, you know, we've got no reason to tar the whole thing with the same brush, and I would strongly advise us not to do that. Um, but for the grace of God, you know, many, many countries can go into this situation, and if we were all, my personal view, if um, every time there was a food scare, you know, a country was suddenly banned from supplying food, Australia had been out of the market with the Gary Baldy incident, if not many other times since. So I think we just need to be a bit more level-headed around it, is my personal view. Just to add quickly to something Jackie mentioned, we can and will grow enough fresh berries in this country. It's the frozen ones that uh, yeah. we to do the <laughs> To do the total yeah. market of mm, demand, right. yeah. Okay, we got another question. Um, it's Paul Fairhall from Austrade. Um, and thanks, Andrew, two honourable mentions for Austrade there in your presentation. Um, but my question, um, is to is to Harry actually? Um, would you um, um, share with us what the capital nature of the operating costs are for moving to protected cropping? Just sort of as a general <coughs> observation on how that's sort of changed your business model, and um, how it dro changes some of those cost drivers. Yeah, look, it's very capital intensive, um, <coughs> and I, I guess you don't go into protected cropping just to grow more of the same. Uh, you, you've got to have superior varieties and, and, and really uh, products which have a high value. Um, but to give you some idea, well, I, I think I mentioned the raspberry story, that, that phenomenal yield increase, but we also had a very high value, much sought after product. If I was just selling normal garden variety raspberries, we'd still be field growing. And similarly with the um, high-tech glass house, um, uh, you get 11 times per square metre the yield out of a, a high-tech glass house you do out of field tomatoes, but you need to. Because, for example, our 20 hectare glass house has $65 million invested. The new 10 hectare glass house we're building uh, is about $48 million. So we're not talking about small amounts of money. So you need to have, but that new glass house is growing high value snacking tomatoes for Jackie's company and a, and a couple of others I won't mention. So, so that's, um, that's very important that you've got the right market pull through to, to do that. Um, it's not for the faint-hearted, but um, if you look at the way climate change is um, knocking us around, we've got still a lot of field crops, and uh, every year we lose money in some areas because of hailstorms and, uh, and other events, you know, super frosts or, or high, high temperatures or whatever. We're protected somewhat by having geographic dispersal, but uh, for our investment across our whole company, uh, we have to have a long more than half tied up in that high capitalisation and that's why we do so much work on R&D and IP because you've got to have the high value crops to, to go with. I don't know whether that answers your question. No. <coughs> oh, g'day, uh, Rob Harris is my name, I'm with the Weekly Times newspaper. Um, country of origin labelling, obviously you've all spoken about the importance of um, branding your products at Australian and that people want Australian produce. Um, and the smart companies seem to be using that as a market advantage in their own labelling. Where does um, government imposed regulation fit with that and how much will it affect your uh, organisations? You want to start off? Oh, I guess I'd better answer something, haven't I? Um, okay, so country of origin labelling. I think the, there's no doubt that customers particularly with fresh product and products that they see as close to fresh are asking for more information. Um, the current legislative framework probably doesn't give them everything that they want to know. Um, so I think it's a case of being very careful about how we work that through. So I was looking at an example in our own business this week of cashews, packets of cashews. You know, we don't do anything that anybody else doesn't do, but they're coming in from about 50 countries because that's the nature of that industry. So it says at the minute, 
product of Australia. Now we can go and say product of Australia made, you know, and then we can give a whole raft of countries beneath it. Um, or we can try and work on a situation that allows us to say something like, you know, Africa and India and, and continental definitions. We've got no issue with doing it where um, it's relevant and meaningful to customers and we can minimise the cost up the chain. My con personal concern with it, when you move beyond your kind of primary or stage one processed ingredients, is you've got to be careful not to limit availability and add incredible amounts of cost into the chain. Um, like if you're looking at something like, um, I'm trying to think of something now, um, a garnish on a, on a ready meal, you know, that garnish could come, or that spice could come from lots and lots of countries and it could move almost weekly or monthly. And you can't be printing packaging every week or month to keep that information. So I think it's a, we've, got to, we've got to find the tipping point at which it really matters to customers and, and it drives their decision making and it's relevant. And then we've got to find a way to give it to them in a method that's clear and um, easy for them to understand. And everyone is following the legislative framework. Um, and I think, you know, Changing the legislation is fine, and I'm sure there's many people who've got to view both sides of it. Uh, I think if you can come up with sens sensible legislation, we already, as Carl's, we already go beyond the minimum labelling requirements, so much of our packaged produce, things like our cranberries, it says, you know, product of America on the back, <coughs> it, it, product of Australia made from, made from American cranberries. So we will do that wherever we can. But you've got to recognise that you can limit manufacturers and suppliers' ability to supply if you get too tight with that regulation. I, I, just to add to that, I think it comes back to the, the categories. And in fresh produce, it's a bit easier in most cases. Maybe not cashews, but most fresh produce, it's much, much clearer. What everyone wants is clarity and, and honesty. Um, we know that uh, Australian consumers in fresh fruit and vegetables uh, want for Australia for two reasons, quality and food safety. That's been pretty well established. Uh, the supermarkets have done a lot of that work to, to establish that. Um, and having said that, it's, it's pretty clear in, in most products. I mean, we uh, and uh, other people import uh, citrus from California out of our eight or nine month window in Australia. But it's very clear if you go to Coles, it'll be produce for Australia or produce or US or, or whatever. And that's the way it should be. So I think we want clarity. And uh, I think in the fresh produce area, I support a change which gives us more openness and clarity, but I do understand what Jackie's saying, when you get to the more complex processing area, it could be a bit of a nightmare. So how they work through that area, I'm not sure. Hi, I'm Steve Lepich from Sastrome Research and Development Institute. A question for Harry, it's not something that's been touched on here, but um, fruit and veg waste is normally about 20% on farm. I'm just interested with your move to protected cropping, how that's actually changed that ratio. and. In the other way, is there a uh, marketing issue with going too much to a factory farm in terms of public feeling? Right. <coughs> I'll deal with the last one first. <coughs> uh, factory farm, yeah. Look, it's a perception. Uh, if, if I took you to our glass houses or, um, or to the, where we grow berries under tunnels or, or even mushrooms in factories, um, they're very clean and green, I've got to tell you. This, you know, we, we've reduced, for example, our uh, pesticide consumption by 45% uh, in, in the last four years. We, in our glasshouse, uh, Gyra, within two years, will be pesticide free. And we don't you know, sing the praise about that, but we're, we're very strong believers in integrated pest management, for example. So uh, it's a bit of a misnomer that you know, factories concentrate things and they do terrible things to the product. Um, so, so I think that's something we, we've um, you know, just got to got to sort of um, take on board that there is a perception, but uh, I think if people see what we do, it's, it's not regarded as, as, as such. Sorry, the first, I got wound up on that, the first part of you. How did you move to factory, sorry, to yeah. um, uh, protected yeah. cropping? Um, oh, the waste, the waste side, yeah, sure. Food yeah. Fruit yeah, yeah. Now look, a lot of work's been done on the agronomy of that. Uh, we've got varieties which suit. Uh, our waste is uh, very much reduced. Uh, You'd have to go through individual categories, but we're running, for example, our glass house with tomatoes uh, between 2 to 5% waste, depending on the cycle, depending on which trusses we're, we're harvesting. Uh, field cropping is, is much higher, and we've experienced that. It's probably more like the, the 20%. Uh, in blueberries, uh, we're getting something like 12 to 16% in the field crop, and we're getting about 5% uh, 
under the tunnel. So that probably gives you a little bit of a, a guide. But can I just add, uh, in a lot of horticultural products, the bigger waste component is actually post-harvest. Mm -hmm. And uh, we spent a lot of time and money uh, working on that. For example, we've we extended the shelf life of our mushrooms by four days uh, and, and also reduced the waste by over half by putting in a lot of new protocols and uh, spending a lot of money on getting from the harvesting the mushroom off the bed, uh, packed and through the vacuum chiller and into our store in under an hour. In under an hour. Every three quarters of an hour you delay, you lose about a day's shelf life. So that sounds easy. When you're doing 500 tonnes of mushrooms a week, it's not. So a lot of work on post-harvest, I'd, I'd suggest, is important as pre-harvest. Another question? OK, we're getting a bit of mood lighting, so um, uh, I've got a question for Andrew. Andrew, you spoke, and uh, I think, yes, we'll pull it up then. Um, Andrew, you spoke about the success of the Citrus uh, Initiative into China. Clearly, clearly successful. You didn't talk about uh, some mistakes you made. So if, if you could play it all back again, what were two errors you made that you would, I guess, you would revisit? What would you do better if you were starting this journey again? What were the two things you'd do better? They might, you might have done it perfectly. Oh, no, I wouldn't claim that. Um, well, I think, first of all, we would probably have uh, tackled the research that was required to get the protocols over the line earlier and invested more in that. I think our industry now realises that you don't sit back and whinge and say, this is difficult, government needs to negotiate something easier. That you can't sit back and wait for the years and years that it might take for that to happen. You actually just get out there and learn how to do it and cost it out and see whether it's going to be viable. And in our case, that did eventually work. But, it, you know, there was kind of five, six years that elapsed there where things could have happened sooner. So that's one thing. Um, I think the other would be to uh, probably try to expose our trade a whole lot earlier in the piece to the realities of China. Um, you know, we did our first trade mission there two years ago. We, we potentially could have done that, uh, you know, a couple of years before that and, and more of them because uh, if any of you have been to China, you'll know there's nothing quite like going there and seeing this. It is an absolute uh, phenomenon and you've got to understand the place, the people, how fast it moves and particularly what, what they're looking for. Thanks, Andrew. And um, I'd, I'd just like to ask everyone to uh, uh, thank our, our speakers today, Brian, Jackie, Harry and, and Andrew for sharing their experience with us.